and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Francois Guichard. I work for UNECE together with ITU on the Future Network Car Symposium. Today is uh, our last day, the fourth day of the symposium for 2023. Um, and uh, we will complete our program by focusing on wireless communications applied to vehicle safety, services, transport management. Let me remind you that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be accessible after the event. So if you miss part of this session, you may watch it offline or later. There are two chat boxes available. Please use the Q&A box to submit your questions at any time. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Russ Schild to moderate our session today. Russ, as you know, has been involved in communication standards for over 40 years. In ITU, he's the chair of the collaboration on ITS standard platform, which normally organize meetings back to back with a symposium. And actually there will be a meeting of the platform tomorrow. Russ is also the ITU representative at UNCE, and he contributes to ensure good collaboration between both UN bodies. In addition, he is essential for the organization of this symposium. I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Russ Shields at this year's symposium. Russ, you have the floor. Thank you, Francois. Um, welcome everybody, whether it's um, evening to you in Asia, um, early morning uh, in a, the Americas are uh, during the middle of the day in um, Europe, uh, India, Africa. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to present this um, fourth session of the 2023 uh, Future Network Car. Um, I'm going to take a minute uh, to really talk about the cooperation with UNECE and ITU. Um, UNECE um, Transport Division, which is located here in Geneva, um, takes the lead on the structure of technology, laws, uh, information, um, all different types of transport. It is the UN Agency for Transport. And one of its key parts is the World Forum for Vehicle Harmonization, um, which close to 100 um, countries um, participate in. Um, and it is responsible for building uh, regulations that are uh, necessary for uh, vehicles, for vehicles to operate properly. And as technology has evolved um, within WP29, it created the uh, working party, uh, the working group on uh, autonomous automated connected vehicles, we call it GRBA. And that has been carefully putting out relevant regulations, including uh, one on cybersecurity, uh, one on um, software updates over the air, and the recent uh, regulation 157 on automated lane keeping systems, which is the first start of true uh, level three systems. ITU is the uh, UN specialized agency for digital technology. And I'm pleased um, to help in bringing the knowledge of digital technologies to um, WP29 as we move forward with the connected and automated vehicles. And just last week, WP29, the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, under its ITS informal group, has created the Task Force on Vehicular Communications. 
and we look for uh, the uh, input um, to that activity as it comes from this session. So that is that is where we're coming from. That is why this is tremendously important. I now would like to move to introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Member Graham. I am very pleased that Michael Graham has agreed to be um, our keynote speaker. Michael Graham is the 45th member of the National Transportation Safety Board in the US. Before joining the NTSB, Member Graham worked for Textron Avionics Aviation, where he uh, served as the Director of Flight Operation Safety, Security and Standardization. Since joining the board, Member Graham hosted the NTSB web series on V2X, uh, preserving the future of connected vehicle technology, participated in the V2X industry panels and delivered a presentation titled The Safety Promise of V2X to the 2022 US Department of Transportation's V2X Communication Summit. He be began his career as an aviator, aviator flying A7s and FA, um, 18s. Member Graham earned his BS in mechanical engineering for the University of New Mexico. He's an also, also a certified airline transport pilot with over 10,000 flight hours. Thank you very much. Please go thank, ahead. Thank you, Russ. I, I appreciate you having me today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Russ. So to understand the safety promise of vehicle to everything or V2X, we must first understand the magnitude of the problem we are trying to solve. In the United States, nearly 43,000 people lost their lives on our roadways in 2021. Those numbers represent the highest number of fatalities since 2005 and the largest annual percentage increase in the fatality analysis reporting system history. In the last seven years, the number of lives lost on U.S. roadways has increased 31 percent. To solve big problems, we must be willing to work towards big solutions. I believe that V2X is one of the most promising, life-saving technologies available today. When connected vehicles talk to each other, they are transmitting data every 10 milliseconds, such as GPS location, acceleration, predicted paths, and driver controls such as steering, input, and braking. V2X applications harness this actionable, predictive data to improve, to improve safety on our roadways. One National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA study, estimates that V2X could address up to 80% of all crashes involving non-impaired drivers. This could save thousands of lives and prevent or mitigate millions of crashes every year. For more than 25 years, the National Transportation Safety Board has released its most wanted list of critical transportation safety improvements to call attention to safety issues requiring immediate attention. Because of the significant safety promise of V2X, the NTSB added connected vehicle technology to its 2021 to 2023 most wanted list. Some may wonder why connected vehicle technology is necessary with the emergence of advanced onboard sensors and the promise of automated vehicles. The NTSB strongly supports sensor-based collision avoidance systems, but as some of our, invest, of our investigations will, that I will discuss later, they demonstrate that sensors, radar, LIDAR, all have limitations such as line of sight, inclement weather, or an unexpected profile of a vehicle. 
Importantly, V2X is not intended to replace the current and future sensors of vehicles. Rather, we can merge onboard sensors with V2X technology to create redundancy and allow for greater confidence when an imminent crash prevention scenario occurs. The way we look at safety on our roadways has changed. To reduce deaths and serious injuries on our roadways, we must look at transport, our transportation network holistically and design a system with layers of protection for all roadway users. Technology and V2X specifically plays a crucial role in achieving our ambitious safety goals. As you can see from just a few of these examples on the slide, V2X applications can help address each element of the safe system approach. Connecting the vehicles on our roadways to each other and the infrastructure removes operational silos and allows for the development of countless applications that have potential, potential to mitigate injuries and save lives. The use cases of V2X technology are broad and include non-safety applications, including improved traffic flow and increased fuel economy. But the NTSB's interest in V2X is specifically on imminent crash prevention and its promise to save lives. In 2014, NHTSA released a comprehensive assessment of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, or V2V -V, readiness in the United States. In that report, researchers found that 22 of the 37 light vehicle pre-crash scenarios could be addressed by V2V -V applications. Comparing those 22 crash scenarios to the Department of Transportation DOT crash data allowed the researchers to conclude that V2V could prevent or mitigate up to 81% of all light vehicle crashes. Those researchers also looked at combined benefits of vehicle to vehicle, that's V2V, and vehicle to infrastructure included and concluded that a fully mature V2X network with vehicles talking with each other, as well as the infrastructure could prevent up to 81% of all vehicle crashes. That's both heavy and light vehicles. In 2015, one of the largest naturalistic V2X driving studies was conducted by Volpe as part of the safety pilot model deployment with approximately 2,800 V2X equipped vehicles. The intent of this deployment was to evaluate V2X technology in a real world driving environment. One remarkable finding from this study was that there was no missed forward collision warning alerts. Out of close to 400 rear end crash scenarios observed, the V2X technology alerted the driver in all of them. Crashes often happen very quickly so imminent crash prevention applications must rely on low latency, high reliability communication. Throughout my presentation, I will discuss NTSB crash investigations in which the crash scenario may have been prevented by imminent crash prevention V2X applications. The NTSB first identified the potential for connected vehicle technology to save lives in 1995 after an investigation of a crash in Menifee, Arkansas. It was January 1995 at 1.50 in the morning on Interstate 40. The lead vehicle entered dense fog and slowed their speed from 65 miles per hour to 35 miles an hour and was struck in the rear. Subsequent collisions occurred. The crash included nine total vehicles and resulted in five fatalities. One surviving driver described the conditions as wide out and said that he could not see the end of the hood of his car. With the limited line of sight and slowed vehicle, the NTSB first recognized the need for collision warning system that was not limited by line of sight or inclement weather and recommended that the FCC or the Federal Communication Commission allocate spectrum to enhance the development of collision warning systems. In 1999, the FCC allocated 75 megahertz of spectrum as part of the Department of Transportation's ITS national program. 
Then, after more than a decade of development and validating research, the NTSB recognized the necessity of widespread V2X deployment and first recommended in 2013 that, the, that NHTSA require connected vehicle technology in all newly manufactured vehicles after an investigation in Chesterfield, New Jersey. On February 16, 2012, at 8.15 in the morning, a school bus carrying 25 elementary school children was traveling north and stopped at a stop sign. At the same time, a dump truck was approaching the intersection traveling east and did not have a stop sign. As you can see from the second picture, the intersection was obstructed, resulting in limited line of sight. The bus driver failed to see the dump truck and proceeded across the intersection. The dump truck struck the side of the bus, resulting in one fatality and 16 injuries. The NTSB found connected vehicle technology could have provided active warnings to the school bus driver, driver or the approaching truck and possibly prevented the crash. Therefore, the NTSB recommended to NHTSA to require connected vehicle technology on all newly manufactured vehicles. In 2017, the NTSB reiterated its recommendation to NHTSA after an investigation in Williston, Florida. In May of 2016, a combination vehicle was making a left turn from the westbound US 27A highway across two eastbound lanes. A Tesla traveling east struck the right side of the combination vehicle at 74 miles per hour, resulting in one fatality. The NTSB found that the 2015 Tesla was equipped, equipped with both automatic emergency braking and forward collision warning, but the system did not detect the combination vehicle. And the system was also not designed to detect crossing path vehicles. Recognizing the limitations of onboard sensors to respond to crash scenarios outside its design capabilities and the potential for connected vehicle technology to fill that safety gap, the NTSB reiterated its connected vehicle recommendation to NHTSA. As V2X applications continue to develop, it became clear that the safety promise of V2X extended to vulnerable road users and not just cars and trucks on our roadways. Therefore, the NTSB, re NTSB released a 2018 safety study on motorcycle safety and a 2019 safety study on bicyclist safety. Between the two safety studies, the NTSB issued six recommendations to incorporate vulnerable road users into the development of connected vehicle technology. Then in 2020, the NTSB reiterated its recommendation to NHTSA to require connected vehicle technology after an investigation in Rochester, Indiana. On the morning of October 30th, 2018 in Rochester, Indiana, the school bus was traveling north on a rural two lane road. The school bus stopped on the east side of the road to pick up 10 students from a mobile home park on the west side of the road. So the students were required to cross the rural road to board the school bus. Conditions were dark, there was no roadway lighting, and there was a curb 900 feet up the road from the, from the bus stop. A 2017 pickup truck traveling south at 58 miles per hour struck four students crossing the road, fatally injuring three and severely injuring the fourth. Once again, the NTSB determined that this crash scenario could have been prevented by connected vehicle technology and reiterated its recommendation to NHTSA. After reiterating the NTSB's recommendation to NHTSA twice and anticipating the impending regulatory upheaval, the NTSB added connected vehicle technology to its most wanted list in April 2021. The following month, the FCC followed through with its notice of proposed rulemaking and issued its final rule, rule to reduce the available spectrum by 60%. In January of 2022, I hosted a four-part V2X video series, preserving the future of connected vehicle technology with guests from industry, academia, 
associations, and federal and state departments of transportation. Finally, in February 2022, the crash in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania was the first opportunity the NTSB had to directly address V2X issues in an accident report since the FCC's recent regulatory action and issued recommendations to both the U.S. Department of Transportation and the U.S. Federal Communications Commission. To set the scene, it was January 5th, 2020, 3.30 a.m., so it's dark outside on a mountainous curve with a 55 mile per hour advisory speed and slight precipitation. A motor coach entered the curve at 77 miles per hour and the excessive steering input from the motor coach driver caused the motor coach to overturn and come to rest perpendicular to the lanes of traffic. The initial rest position blocked both lanes and shoulders. After the motor coach came to rest, three tractor trucks and a passenger vehicle struck the overturned motor coach, resulting in five fatalities and 50 injuries. The picture of the overturned motor coach on the slide was taken from the FedEx truck's forward-facing camera. The FedEx driver described the overturned motor coach as a black wall, making it very difficult to see. All three track uh, tractor trucks were equipped with collision avoidance system, including automatic emergency braking. The NTSB found that the circumstances of the impact for each of the three trucks were likely outside the capabilities of the collision avoidance system on the vehicle. Many of the current limitations to onboard site line of sight sensors were present in this crash, such as seeing around a curve, inclement weather, in an unexpected orientation of the overturned motor coach. Therefore, the NTSB found that connected vehicle technology, if it had been installed on the vehicles involved in the crash, could have provided information to the drivers of the tractor trucks and passenger vehicle so that the drivers could have been alerted to the overturned motor coach. At the NTSB, we strongly support V2X technology because of the promise to save lives. Crashes can happen very quickly, so to prevent crashes, the communication between vehicles must be accurate and reliable. There's little room for error. When harmful inter interference is introduced to the communication, the accuracy and the reliability is impaired. In the Mount Pleasant report, we found that recent regulatory action by the FCC allows for potential of harmful interference from unlicensed devices and threatens the deployment of V2X technology. Therefore, we recommend that the FCC implement appropriate safeguards to protect V2X communication from that harmful interference. Unequivocally, regulatory uncertainty has hindered the deployment of V2X technology. For years, the industry was developing the technology based on the assumption that it would, be, it would be deployed in 75 megahertz of the 5.9 gigahertz band, free from harmful interference. Then the FCC shrunk the spectrum by 60% and introduced the potential for harmful interference. This created significant regulatory uncertainty and had a severe chilling effect on the industry. At the NTSB, we recognize the industry's scars from the recent regulatory upheaval, but we cannot let those scars prevent us from realizing the benefits of, of V2X. The only path that remains is forward. To solve the remaining regulatory uncertainty and achieve widespread deployment, it will require buy-in from automakers and infrastructure owner operators in coordination among various federal agencies such as the Department of Transportation and the Federal Communication Commission. The NTSB believes the DOT at the secretary level is in the best position to coordinate and lead these efforts. Therefore, in the Mount Pleasant report, the NTSB issued a recommendation to the Department of Transportation to implement a plan for nationwide connected vehicle deployment and to solve the outstanding problems such as interference from out-of-bands emissions, insufficiency of spectrum for advanced V2X applications, and division amongst communication protocols. 
In the United States and around the world, B2X is one of the most promising life-saving technologies available today. We have a clear and present opportunity to transform our transportation network into one that is safer, smarter, and more efficient. However, developing and deploying V2X in a way that is widespread, secure, and inoperable and it is a complex problem. To solve this complex problem, it'll take collaboration amongst regulators, infrastructure owner operators, and private industry. Regulators must provide infrastructure owner operators and industry with a regulatory certainty, a timeline, and deployment targets that allows for widespread deployment of B2X app technology. Regulatory certainty will immediately incentivize stakeholders to increase V2X investment and deployment. I've spoken to automakers and infrastructure owner operators who remain committed to the V2X technology, but instead are on the sidelines due to volatile regulatory environment. Infrastructure owner operators should develop a V2X readiness plan that aligns with the timelines and targets of regulators and automakers. Infrastructure owner operators are a critical piece of the early deployment because when vehicle penetration is low, the V2X safety benefit will be achieved when those vehicles interact with equipped intersections. Industry must also act. We have seen many pilot programs on, lo on the local level demonstrating the potential safety promise of V2X, but the safety promise cannot be achieved without widespread deployment from automakers. The full safety promise of V2X is only realized when we reach a critical mass of vehicles on our roadways. In closing, I want to remind you of the problem we are trying to solve. Last year, nearly 43,000 people lost their lives on US roadways. 43,000 people traveling to and from work, school or social events did not return home to their families. The lives lost on our roadways are not statistics. They are mothers, fathers, grandparents, and children. They are teachers, firefighters, nurses, and engineers. Each life lost is someone's story without a happy ending. Each life lost is a tragedy. We must do better for all of them. B2X is one of the most promising safety technologies, technologies available today. Widespread B2X deployment promises to save thousands of lives and prevent or mitigate millions of crashes. Regulators, infrastructure owner operators and industry must work together to achieve that safety promise. To learn more about the NTSB's V2X investigations and recommendations, and to access the four-part video series I hosted on preserving the future of connected vehicle technology, please visit ntsb.gov slash v2x. And with that, that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Member Graham. That was a tremendous start to this session, highlighting uh, the important safety values of um, v to v um, and V2X technology. Uh, a couple of quick questions. One, just from my own interest, um, your background is that you started as a fi fighter pilot. Um, the keynote speaker from session two, Missy Cummings, also started as a fighter pilot. Um, how do you see the safety capabilities, really, I would call it the safety culture around being a fighter pilot, um, carry forward some within air, air transport. How do you see that being um, important in bringing to um, the road transport um, parts of the, the world? Well, Russ, that's a, that's a really good question because uh, aviation has had a, uh, a very good safety record over the years and it, it just didn't happen. 
uh, the industry had to work very hard at it. Um, there's some, you know, I, I was drawn to B2X, I think mainly because of, of the technology and the technologies that I used to fly in aviation. Um, but uh, that culture is hard to find amongst all the different transportation modes. So I think uh, through its development, uh, everybody's gonna have to work really hard in sharing information. Aviation safety got became uh, a much safer over the years after everybody came together and understood that uh, we don't compete when it comes to safety. And I think that's what's gonna have to happen here, especially with V2X, is the culture is gonna have to come together that if somebody learns something they need, you know, from, from a bad situation or a bad incident or a bad crash, they need to share that with everybody so we don't reinvent the wheel over and over. And that's kind of the way aviation safety got its good safety record is that we, we didn't compete when it came to safety. And the culture was always there to figure out what went wrong, to debrief it and make sure it doesn't happen again to that crew or other crews out there. And it would be great to see that in, with this Vic, V2X technology as it comes to uh, fruition over the next few years. Comes to fruition, that's a great term. Do you think that we need to have a regulation requiring V2X to be able to make it come to fruition? Well, that's another good question. Um, I This V2X is a very complicated uh, uh, situation. It, it's gonna require um, working together. Uh, and it's, it, it's gonna take not just automobile manufacturers, because it's gonna be taking uh, uh, infrastructure owner operators to work together. Um, and it's gonna take the regulator because we can't have what, what happened before. We have people setting out, working on one communication standard, and then all of a sudden uh, the, the band of spectrum gets taken away or the communication protocol has changed that's not going to work. We're not going to reach those mass critical number of vehicles and infrastructure working together. That's the only way this is going to work and we're going to see the safety benefit. So there has to be some kind of cooperation. I think it'll eventually have to be some regulation, but we shouldn't wait. In the meantime, I think we can do something that was similar to the automatic emergency braking voluntary agreement that happened. Uh, to start reaching that critical mass. And I would love to see some kind of agreement like that at least getting started, but there's gotta be some guarantee up front from the potential of harmful interference that, that it's protected. And we need, the industry needs to start using what spectrum it has left over. If we don't, I'm afraid we're gonna lose that part of the spectrum too. So yes, we need some regulation, I believe, but let's not let us hold us up from starting the development and deployment. Okay, uh, great. Uh, let's leave it at that for now and we'll pick up in the uh, discussion. Uh, at this point, I wanna move forward to our second presentation from Andres Velarde. Um, Andres graduated from Budapest University of Technology and Business and has a decade long experience in the field of vehicle communications. Acting as the research director of Comsignia since 2017, he is responsible for the planning and management of the company's standardization and prototyping activities, including the delegation lead for more than 10 standardization groups globally. He has been a member of the Car to Car Communications Consortium since 2011. Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Let me share my screen. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, Today I'm going to talk about uh, where, where Europe is and more, more especially where Europe is heading to 
and what's the, the, the situation there, where, what are our plans. I will try to talk about the problems, the solutions, the applications, the underlying uh, facilities that we are building. Uh, and I would like to thank you also for, for Niels Kovanderson, uh, the general manager of car to car for this opportunity. But I will try to represent uh, uh, more entities than just the car to car. So car to car communication consortium, in case you don't know, is an OEM group uh, representing the European OEMs uh, for V2X. Uh, it's been funded in 2002 and we are continuously working on um, on V2X communication dedicated for those uh, direct communications. Um, so you should be familiar with, with these two slides. Um, uh, on the top, you see the current uh, uh, generations, day one, day two, day three. And at the bottom, you can see um, the, the usual figure that is showing the timeline of an accident and showing the different systems that are intervene that are involved in preventing a crash or reducing the severity of a crash and uh, what i want to start with is that we have what, what what are we doing what do we need to do now and you know um there are so um currently we are uh, de uh deploying awareness driving and we are very much working on uh to share sensory information and in the far future, we have cooperative driving and maneuver coordination. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's something that's, that's the application part. And that's the functional part that we are working on. In parallel, we, are actually, we actually need to also work on quality, trust, and reliability. Because right now, these systems are uh, used in, uh, for, to provide information and, and prevent the crash. And we also foresee a lot of efforts needs to be spent on third party information. So car reacting on another car's information um, for this information to be trusted and, and high enough quality. We need much more precision, much more data in, in preventing these. And uh, just, to, just to link to the previous presentation, uh, we need to do this fast because just last week, actually, uh, if you remember the first example, uh, the dust storm or the, the, the fog, there was actually a quite no, a big accident in Hungary where I live and 40 cars crashed because of a dust storm on a highway, which actually I, I drove one hour before that. So these examples from the last presentations are actually not like corner cases. These are actually happening around us and we need to speed up fast. And we are all, I guess, working on speeding up this process in order to, to get there. And the first step, yes, would be awareness driving and you know, connected cars talking to each other. But the next uh, step, what we need to take is, is share what these cars are seeing and in the long run maneuver automatically. But in parallel, we also need to make sure that it's not just informative uh, 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 to the driver, but also that, that V2X gets into ADAS and AD systems in a reliable way, in a trustworthy way, and are involved in, 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 um, in active safety. But that's a long road, a long road to go, so we have a lot to do. Um, going more into the details on, on how communication can help uh, an ADAS or an AD system. And what you can see here as, of course, a normal ADAS system is, is using the vehicle sensors uh, in order to, to detect uh, any potential uh, crash. Uh, and create an environment of perception and then plan a reactive maneuver or, or an active or passive uh, um, activity. But if you add communication, you can actually improve the environment of perception because if cars can talk to each other, you will be aware of all the connected cars. So your pure sensor-based perception will be enriched with this uh, V2X data. But we can go for, for, uh, forward with this. And you can have uh, uh, cooperative sensing, which means that if I can see with the eyes of the other car and the other car are, are sharing all the non-connected vehicles, then actually I have much, much more data. And this, uh, this, this environment of perception is much more deeper and much better. And in the end, we will have also, and, and this would, by the way, improve, of course, the reactive maneuvers uh, by automated reaction based on the third-party data that I was, I was mentioning previously. 
uh, and and of course, in the long run, when we are having uh, maneuver coordination, we could have also cooperative maneuvering when cars negotiate with each other um, in 10 or 20 or 30 years from. Now. So what are the, the, the imminent to do's and the imminent future outlook for the next few years? Um, we really um, uh, need to increase the benefits and lower the risk and the entry cost of, of V2X globally. We, we see that safety is, is you know, hard to sell in, in, a, in, a, in a formulated badly. So we need to somehow mix uh, the safety services and the convenience services of V2X so that we not only provide, for example, someone from A to B safely, but efficiently and faster. So there is a lot of gain from, from vehicular communication in general. Um, we also see that, that, um, that there is some sort of, uh, we need to increase uh, the security of investments. So, uh, you know, a car's lifetime is 15 years and, and the road operators are investing in 20, 25 years ahead. So we need to make sure that those investments are, are going forward and we need to find all the financial and legal uh, uh, background for this to, to actually happen. So, so that's, that's something that we need, to, we need to improve and we need to continue improving that. The, uh, the, other, the, the, the other thing that we were talking about is continuous operation design domain, meaning that uh, systems cannot, so automated driving uh, needs a certain environment to operate in. And again, in the pre previous presentation, you saw corner cases when this didn't work. And V2X is actually a low hanging fruit. So if you are able to get information from another viewpoint, uh, that, that uh, hidden truck or that unseen uh, uh, event begins to, uh, I mean, can be seen and can be foreseen because you're actually seeing from the other's eye and getting information from a lot of other actors, not just from your own viewpoint. So actually V2X is very, very good for those uh, corner cases where, where the current automated driving or the current ADA systems cannot, cannot operate. And so we think that automated driving is possible without V2X, but it's really slow and ineffective. So it's actually a must uh, uh, to say out loud. Um, the other uh, low hanging fruit is, is, is robustness and redundancy. So what if something is not available? What if the, the road markings are blurred? That's everything, everything like that can be provided digitally uh, from a third party or from a service provider. So that also increases uh, the data available for an ADAS or AD in order to operate safely and operate on a higher uh, function and protect you much, uh, much, much more. Um, so a little bit about car-to-car -car and C-roads and what we are doing, um, because it's not just standard. So a lot of uh, uh, the industry thinks that we, if we have the standard, if we have the CAM or BSM standard, we have that service. And it's actually just the first step. So we need, to, we need to think about how these standards should be used, how the cooperative products needs to be used. So car to car and C-Roads are working on profiles which define the cooperative part of products that needs to be out in the field. Um, and we also just recently published a white paper on the day two use cases. So that's available for download from the car to car website, which explains how we, how we see the future. Um, and also, uh, let me here emphasize that, that it's also very important that car-to-car -car is not just focusing on, on the OEM part. We, we have bi-weekly meetings with C-Roads, and C-Roads is the road operators consortium of European road operators. We have these calls because actually we need to deploy services and protective mechanisms in parallel together because we are building an ecosystem. So, one, one, one vehicle will not, not uh, solve the problem. We actually need the intersections uh, and the backend services and everything like that be, to, be, to be harmonized and services needs to be deployed in this way. So the roadmaps are harmonized, the services are harmonized. And actually I put a link in my presentation and you can actually get a live map of all the roadside units that are connected uh, right now in Europe. So you can see that system is actually being built and. And, and being deployed. We have currently in Europe around 1 million connected uh, vehicles right now. And that's a good basis where we are able to, uh, to, to build these uh, services forward. 
um, but also think about uh, compliance and testing. Um, and, and we are also thinking the regulatory environment uh, on, on these calls. So it's, it's much, much more. The one, one of what I want to say is there are much more steps that need to be taken than just writing the standards and thinking about the specifications. There is a lot of harmonization and, and testing ongoing in car to car, which is very important. Um, this just shows uh, an example. So on the left, you can see just an exa a roadworks example, how it looks like on a very high level. And on the right, you actually see like two or three years of development of a very fine detailed specifications, which is testable on how a European cross uh, country roadworks warning service type, which is cross border and works for works in, works in every country would would actually look like. Uh, and where to go from where to go from here on what, on what, what, what uh, else is happening inside car to car So we actually have been updating our roadmap and, and, and plan features with two very interesting new ecosystems uh, or service types. Uh, one of them coming from the Connected Motorcycle Consortium. Uh, we have now not just vehicle to vehicle, but we also have vehicle to motorcycle and motorcycle to vehicle applications uh, defined. Uh, so that's something that is, is currently being uh, being uh, uh, defined and, and, and planned. And the other is uh, AEF and the agriculture um, uh, uh, vendors, because if you think about it, there are a lot of uh, uh, platooning ongoing with, with automated agriculture machines uh, where V2X could be used. And also they could, V2X could be used by agriculture machines when they are entering public roads. And there is a safety risk there uh, with the slow moving vehicles. So those are the new use cases and new ecosystems that we are adding uh, to the, the, the previously vehicle and infrastructure based um, uh, world uh, within Europe. The, the second big uh, group that we are uh, working on is the, the micro mobility sector, the e-bikes, um, e-scooters causing a lot of um, uh, injuries and, and, and problems in, in Europe. And what we see is that 75% of all these fatalities are from uh, not seeing or not being seen. And, and B2X is the technology built for being seen. So that's by design the best, best solution. So what we are actually seeing is that the uh, e-bike the, the e manufacturers are actually uh, looking for safety solutions. Safety is starting to sell. People are actually wanting to pay uh, for a bike that is connected. So what we want to do is want, we want to offer them a role in this ecosystem and have bikes produce uh, um, um, vans or, or cams or PSMs uh, for that matter um, uh, in order to get them visible and, 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 and get, the, uh, get a two-dimensional warning uh, if there is, a, there is a crash, there is an imminent crash there. So that's a very active new, new area where we uh, are, are, are evolving. And uh, let me talk about the two uh, big, big functions that we are seeing. So one of them is collective perception, um, sensor sharing, which I was mentioning. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the possibility to take one sensor, uh, sensor detection and share it uh, with another vehicle. And um, that's very important because a connected vehicle is as clever as the information that, that, that's given to him. So the more information we are able to provide, the better services can be built on such a vehicle. So why is CPM very important? Well, it's important because it's connecting non-connected entities. So uh, a pedestrian or a running uh, deer across the highway can be detected by sensors. And that detection is now no longer the asset of that one single vehicle. If that, that vehicle is connected, it can share that detection with other vehicles. Um, so it can connect or digitalize non-connected entities. You don't, you will never put an onboard unit or a connectivity unit on a, a wild animal, for example. So that's how we are, want to deal with those uh, uh, safety use cases. Um, V2X doesn't uh, deteriorate over range. So your detection of a deer, for example, is as precise as if you would be neighbor it because V2X can deploy a sensor far away. So you, if you would be in your Eagle vehicle and you would try to detect something 500 meters away, 
that would deteriorate. But if you have someone in the vicinity, that sensor detection sent to you will be very precise because the actual sensor that's providing this information to you digitally is actually very close to the, to the detected object. So it works very much. Um, it can fundamentally improve forward collision warning or EEBL and all these other applications because you're adding much more data, much more awareness, more objects into the V2X ecosystem over the air. So that's very important that it increases the, the, the potential of these applications. And it's also a win-win uh, for the OEM and smart cities because if smart cities see a dangerous intersection, they just put a sensor in the intersection, which will provide this sensor sharing data, and everyone will be digitalized and protected to, for all the communicated, for all the connected cars. So it's actually, and by the way, the intersection also can see from the sensor from the car. So everyone is benefiting from the other's investment and, and cities can invest in increasing uh, several locations uh, with, with CPM. Um, and the last use case, which I wanted to mention and which is, which is uh, the current uh, uh, long-term goal is cooperative maneuvering and cooperative merging. Um, which are, you know, when V2X will no longer just be a sensor and will not no longer be just another smart sensor. It will be the, the language of connectivity. And, and uh, think about the future when a lot of cars will be, will be driven automatically and platoons will be on the highway. How do you plan to merge into a highway, which is like, you know, high speed, very close to each other, going on the on the sideway well you need somehow to ask them to let you in and that new language that that new negotiation type is what is coming out with connected cars and actually it can be also retrofitted into old cars and can be parts of new cars so that type of 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 of, of uh, negotiation and, in, and information interchange is something that will make v2x go beyond just being a new sensor and be the new connectivity uh, uh, solution and will be much more uh, than that. Uh, thank you very much. That that uh, that's what I wanted to say about Europe right now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it was a very useful um, discussion. Um, I think we'll move on with presentations so we can have more time for the questions. So next. I'd like to introduce uh, John Kenny. Uh, John is the Director of Connected Mobility Research and the Senior Principal Researcher at Toyota Info Technology Labs in Mountain View, California. He and his team research vehicular communications technology and end-to-end -end connected mobility services. He represents Toyota in international standards organizations and industry groups, including SAE, IEEE, Etsy, ITS America, and the car to car consortium um, that we just heard from. So um, please uh, go ahead, John. Thank you very much, much, Russ, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm very glad to be with you today, and, and I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to follow uh, Member Graham, uh, who I had the privilege of uh, uh, doing one of those uh, V2X interviews with that he spoke about. And also, Andras, it's nice to see you again. And I find that our presentations are, are very well aligned. I think that's not surprising. I'm going to talk about V2X applications uh, broadly in this talk. And uh, some of what I'll talk about will overlap with what you hear from others. Maybe some of it will be, uh, you'll hear it here for the first time. Are you, are you able to see my screen? I just have a little reset on my. Yes, it's okay now. Okay. Let me continue. Uh, just very quickly, um, I, am, I am with Toyota's Infotech Labs. We're located in Silicon Valley and have been here for more than 20 years. And we are uh, the part of Toyota that is focused on connected mobility research, uh, especially uh, for the US, but also with scope uh, for other regions of the world. So uh, I, I like to start with a definition just so we're all uh, thinking in the same terms. Uh, in this case, V2X, what is V2X? Of course, it's vehicle to everything communication. 
uh, but I really want to focus on on the, the the fact that it's direct communication from a vehicle to another vehicle or to a vulnerable road user, a pedestrian or a bicyclist or a road worker, or to and from uh, road infrastructure. That's what uh, I'm going to be. That's what I mean by direct V2X in this talk. Uh, you'll know that some people uh, include a broader set of communication, including over a telecommunication network or V2N uh, under the label of V2X. And while that indirect communication is useful, it's not, uh, it's not going to be the subject of this talk. So why is V2X useful? Um, uh, I think we, we have heard some of this, but it's, it's good, I think, to put it very explicitly on the screen. Uh, first and foremost, we're interested in V2X because of what it can do for us uh, to promote safety. Uh, and, and, and as Michael mentioned, that's the, that's the primary, imminent, imminent collision avoidance is, is probably the primary reason that we're, we're so motivated to pursue V2X. It can also help with uh, moving traffic more efficiently. That has uh, also benefits with regard to energy savings. Uh, and a new area that uh, has opened up uh, uh, in the last few years is to use V2X to help with the automated driving problem. Um, I'll talk about that. And we can also use it for things like transactions on the road, like tolling. So at the heart of V2X is this idea of imminent collision avoidance using vehicle to vehicle communication. And, and uh, this is not a new idea. This has been around for uh, more than uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, uh, I was involved in some of the pre-competitive research that really proved the, the, the viability of this with, with other automakers. Um, uh, and our report came out in 2010, proving that this works. So what, what is the concept? The concept is that every vehicle will send frequently a status message uh, called, in the US, we call it the basic safety message. And it includes all of the core vehicle state information that another vehicle would want to have to avoid crashing with that vehicle. And you can see some of the key items there in the, in the text box, location, heading, acceleration, uh, speed. Uh, and if you send these frequently, these status messages, then uh, other vehicles can receive them, can make their own assessments about whether where collision threats might exist, and then can either warn the driver or even take automated control of the car um, in response to those threats. And we call it the BSM here and other regions. Of course, it's known by other names, for example, the cooperative awareness message in, in the Etsy world. So with that kind of exchange, what can we do? Well, we can do a lot. And, and uh, in fact, ultimately this is only limited by the, the uh, creativity of, of those designing the, the applications on the receiving end. Um, we've shown uh, a wide variety of imminent collision avoidance scenarios that BSMs enable. Uh, I'm showing uh, six or seven of them here. Um, probably most of these are, are already pretty familiar to you. Um, let me just focus in the middle of the screen for a moment on two intersection collision uh, scenarios that can be avoided with V2X and point out that um, the analysis that NHTSA performed leading up to the, um, to the V2V rulemaking that was initiated several years ago but was never completed, that analysis showed that just these two intersection applications alone could save more than a thousand lives per year. And as uh, Michael already mentioned, um, in total, V2X is estimated by the US Department of Transportation to be able to address approximately 80% of crash scenarios involving non-impaired drivers. So uh, there's a lot we can do just with a basic safety message. One uh, technical note is that when you have a high vehicle density environments with a lot of BSM senders, we have to start worrying about congesting the communication channel. So uh, Channel congestion control is an important feature, uh, but fortunately that's been tackled uh, and, and, and is already well standardized. Uh, for example, you can see references to FC standards and SAE standards that address channel congestion control for basic safety messages and for CAM messages. Uh, we can also enhance safety with communication, not just from vehicles, but from roadside infrastructure and from uh, vulnerable road users themselves. Uh, you see three examples here, a red light violation warning that can be um, achieved with information coming from the signal controller, a traffic cue warning 
Uh, this one is coming from a, a system that's deployed in Japan um, and a pedestrian uh, crossing warning, which can come with a, what we call either, either come from what we call a personal safety message uh, typically would be sent by a handheld device, a personal device that that's, uh, the pedestrian is, is carrying, or by an in infrastructure uh, with equipped with sensors that can detect the presence of the pedestrian and then um, broadcast the, pre the presence of that pedestrian in uh, something like the collective perception message that Andras mentioned earlier. So we have a couple different ways of attacking that, uh, that safety issue. Let me turn to the area of cooperative automated driving uh, and explain what we mean by that term. So on the left side of this screen, you see a, a, a rough diagram of the kind of the traditional core functions of, of an automated driving system. The, the vehicle has local sensors that feed data into uh, uh, functions that are, are performing mapping, uh, localization, perception, to, to get a sense of, of where, the, where the car is and what's around it. And with that information, it makes a path plan and then, uh, and, and then executes that with, with actuators. Uh, what we've realized is that if you can augment the local sensor information by bringing in V2X data from other sources, either other vehicles or from roadside devices that have sensors, uh, you, can, you can turn all of those functions into cooperative functions. Uh, mapping becomes cooperative mapping. You can get a better idea of, of what the map is. Cooperative localization, you can get a better idea of where you are on the map. Cooperative perception, you can get a better idea of what's surrounding you. And cooperative path planning can result from that, where you can do a better job of, of navigating through the map and, and even uh, negotiating with others on the map for how you're going to move through uh, space. So that's what we mean by cooperative automating driving and and this is an exciting part of the of the sphere of, of applications that v2x can enable and that leads me to um, an, a, a taxonomy that I want to introduce that uh, maybe maybe you've heard about maybe you haven't this comes from the same SAE group that brought us the famous five levels of automated driving that I think everyone has heard about this is a this is kind of a, a, a uh, an analogous effort to classify different ways in which cooperative information might be exchanged among uh, among actors, especially in a V2X environment. Um, so uh, if you if you focus on the the yellow blocks uh, just above the arrow, you see the five classes of cooperative communication that this standard J3216 identifies, starting with class A status sharing, uh, class B intent sharing, class C agreement seeking, and class D prescriptive. So what do these mean? Well, class A status sharing is essentially here I am and here's what I see. And most of what we talk about in the V2X sphere falls under status sharing, at least so far. Things like certainly the basic safety message or the spat and map message from the intersections or even the collective perception messages. Uh, these are all status sharing. This is what I see. This is what's going on around me right now. And it helps with use cases that are basically awareness and perception use cases. If we move beyond that though, some exciting things can begin to open up. Um, if we move to intent sharing, then, then that's not just what, I, what I'm doing right now, but it, this is what I plan to do. And that can be enormously powerful if you have the ability to communicate that. And in an era as we're in an era where we are, our, our vehicles will be increasingly automated. They also will have a better and better uh, ability to uh, communicate their intent. So um, with that information, another vehicle can predict um, when I'm what that I'm when I'm about to make a lane change, for example, and that can improve uh, safety and efficiency. If we go even further into class C agreement seeking, now this is not just what I plan to do, but let's let's plan to do something together. Let's let's negotiate about something, and you can imagine this uh, easily uh, helping with uh, scenarios like uh, cooperative merging or platooning operations. And then finally, uh, the class C prescriptive type of communication is 
uh, it's really is more more for uh, for authorities to announce the, announce the uh, the rules and, and and change the rules if they need to be changed, and and provide direction, um, perhaps regulatory direction. Uh, so uh, when you receive this, you will you will do as directed. Um, this could be things like uh, changing the speed limit or announcing um, uh, that that a certain lane is not available. So this, um, go back for a second. This this four class taxonomy can be thought of as somewhat orthogonal to the the automated driving levels. And in fact, if you read this standard, you'll see a matrix that um, shows uh, the the driving levels in the columns and and these um, cooperation classes in the rows and and different combinations that uh, make sense within that um, within that way of thinking. It's a powerful way to help organize our thought. So if you were using this kind of, um, if you're using this taxonomy and, and applying it to a given use case, what you'd find is that typically a use case is going to involve more than one of these classes of communication. And by the way, these classes don't apply to the vehicle themselves, they apply to each individual message. So a given vehicle might be transmitting any or all of those classes on, on successive uh, messages. So for example, in the top of the screen here, you can see that if the, let's say there was a lane closure uh, because of a work zone uh, scenario, um, that could easily in, in involve um, communication of types class A, C, and D. A for awareness, uh, there could be a broadcast from a, a roadside uh, equipment uh, announcing the, the lane closure, the work zone. Um, C, you could, you could imagine between vehicles one and two there, they might be engaging in, in uh, a let's do this together type of, of communication to facilitate uh, the, the lane change from uh, vehicle one so it can merge into the, to the left lane. And it could be a prescriptive type of communication as well. Maybe a road, uh, an authority on site there is announcing that the, the speed limit is reduced. Uh, similarly, on the bottom half of the screen, uh, this is a, uh, a diagram that is, is showing uh, a, a cooperative following type of operation like a platoon. And again, we can see that multiple of the cooperation classes might be involved. So um, certainly we need to know typical awareness information like a, ba a basic safety message would send in class A, um, but it's also useful, for example, if the platoon leader is uh, able to announce an intention ahead of time, for example, to reduce speed, so that all the other members of the platoon are aware of that and can um, and can plan pr appropriately. And uh, there could be agreement seeking type of communication, for example, to admit a new car into the middle of the platoon and make space for it. Uh, so again, these um, this is a use case that involves classes A, B, and C out of that uh, taxonomy. And these diagrams, by the way, come from the J3216 standard. So you, if you pick up that standard, you can read about this in more detail. Uh, to wrap up, I wanted to, um, to turn briefly to the situation in Japan. Uh, uh, I work for Toyota, so i um, like to talk about what's happening with V2X there as well. Um, in, in Japan, the, the direct V2X system uh, goes by the name ITS Connect, and you can see there's a, the, a link there to, uh, to the uh, ITS Connect consortium where you can read more about it. Um, uh, this slide says more than 250,000 vehicles are, are equipped uh, in Japan, I, and I think it's getting closer to 300,000 by now. So along with Europe, um, where, where deployments have, I think by now exceeded a million vehicles on the road, uh, Japan is really the other region of the world that, is, that has had some success in, in, uh, in making significant progress toward the goal of widespread deployment. Um, and, it's, and it's worthwhile for us to, to see how things are going there. Um, there, there are some thumbnail um, images here of different applications that are part of the ITS Connect portfolio. Uh, many of them, like the collision avoidance assistance, are, are things that you'll see everywhere uh, in the world and, 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 are, and are really central to the V2X mission. Um, and then there are a few that are a little bit more uh, specific. 
um, a, for example, uh, information from a bus about uh, about the passengers and that are that are leaving the bus that vehicles may need to know as they approach a bus. Uh, so that's the ITS Connect system in Japan. And waiting for the slide to advance. Let me skip that one. So that brings me to my summary. Um, just to summarize, Direct V2X is, is a key technology. It can support safety, including imminent crash avoidance. It can, it can support traffic efficiency, driving automation, and other areas of applications. Uh, it's characterized by low latency and use of, of free spectrum. It's an ad hoc communication approach. It's not organized by a network provider. Um, and that brings challenges, but it also um, helps facilitate the low latency aspect and, and really is, is, is a central characteristic of the communication. Um, we've seen that analyses show that if you, if you have widespread V2X deployment, you can address uh, on the order of 80% 80, 80 of, of the crashes that are occurring today and that are causing so much uh, damage, as Michael uh, mentioned. Um, the cooperative automated driving application area is, is a very interesting and new one um, as automated driving becomes more in, uh, integrated into the, into the general automotive um, environment. Um, I think we, we can strive to improve that by adding cooperation uh, to that set of applications as well. And then finally, uh, just to, to, to be aware that we do have this taxonomy coming out of SAE to help us uh, maybe organize our thoughts around uh, it, cooperation and cooperative communication, especially for more advanced applications as they begin to emerge. We can we can think about them in these different classes of, of um, awareness or intent sharing or agreement seeking or prescriptive type of communication. And with that, um, I thank you very much. And Russ, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, John. Um, very nice to hear from you again um we'll move on to the running as usual a little little late on these um we've heard from europe um we've heard from us um japan's picked up and i now want to turn to china as uh, china has been one of the the leads in this and i'm very pleased to have hang sun as the speaker Hang is senior uh, engineer and director of intelligent and connected vehicle department of ASRI uh, Katark. And Katark is an organization I know very well, is really a, a leader in automotive research and is part of the Chinese uh, ministry uh, MMI, MIIT um, information, uh, industry and information technology. He is secretary of the ICV subcommittee of NTCAS, which is uh, part of the uh, standards for S SAC TC 114 SC 34. These are um, very long and complicated letters, but there are, if you go on the website and look up in the Qatar and standards in China, you will find these documents and they're really very correct. Um, he's also Chinese delegate to ISO um, TC 204 and to um, as we talked about before, um, the UN WP29 um, working group on um, autonomous and automated um, vehicles. Uh, Mr. Sun uh, mainly engages in the standardization of intelligent and connected vehicles. He is the core drafter of the Chinese national guideline for ICV standard system development. I look forward to Sun of really telling us where how China is doing as it's a big leader in this area. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Russ. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, this is the 
Sun Hong from Kodak China. And uh, it's my pleasure to join today's discussion. Um, I would like to introduce a little bit about the uh, development status of the ICV industry and the standard system in China. Uh, first of all, a little bit about, about who we are. We are the uh, ICCT uh, Technical Committee 114, uh, the National Technical Committee for Automotive Standardization. Uh, now under the Technical Committee, uh, we have 29 specialized subcommittees with more than 1,000 members spread it in the uh, whole Chinese automotive industry. Well, uh, if you can see the colored block, the subcommittee 34, this is a newly established subcommittee specialized uh, with the intelligent and connected vehicles standard. Um, that's uh, who we are. And for today's introduction, mainly uh, includes uh, four parts. The first is the technical uh, concept of ICV. I believe most of you have already know uh, some similar concepts like the automated driving vehicles, the automated and uh, connected vehicles, smart cars, and uh, even the future networked cars. Actually, the ICV is a uh, similar concept. Um, it is the intelligent and connected vehicles, and it is widely used in the Chinese industry. Um, how to understand this? Actually, it's quite simple. It's um, um, is kind of the uh, traditional vehicle uh, empowered by the features uh, of a combination of intelligence and uh, connectivity. Uh, that's the uh, um, definition. The vehicles that can cap uh, are capable of conducting information interaction with external ent entities or designed with advanced features, including environmental perception, self decision making and automated control or further to the inclusion of realizing systematic cooperative control that's the definition of icv in china and for the technologies regarding to icv it it is involved with a variety of concepts and technologies like the adas automated driving cybersecurity, and functional safety as as uh, today's topics the v2x and for the automated electronics will serve as the uh, basic or the uh, supporting um, elements for the whole uh, um, ICV industry. Uh, that's the whole picture of uh, the concept of the ICV. And I would like to introduce the, de the development st uh, status of the ICV industry in China. <clears throat> if you look at this picture, um, there are a lot of the uh, pillar zones uh, all over China. Uh, actually, for this uh, V2X activities, the Ministry of uh, Industry and Information Technology, together with the Ministry of Public Security and the Ministry of Transport, are leading the construction of these pillar areas. Right now, in China, we have thirteen. Uh, we have uh, seventeen national level test sites, um, and. Uh, 20 uh, local testing set that which are uh, supporting by the local governments. Um, and uh, the uh, in China right now, the uh, uh, intelligent and connected vehicles are in ac uh, actively uh, inactive with the smart cities. Uh, China is systematically promoting the coordinated development of the dual uh, intelligence, which are the intelligent vehicles plus smart cities. Um, the Be Beijing is um, a typical uh, example for a smart city. Right now in Beijing, we have uh, 200 roads for testing and the demonstration of the automated driving and V2X applications uh, with the dimension of 700 kilometers uh, roads. Um, and uh, uh, if you look at these pictures, there are a lot of the applications, including the robot taxi, the shuttle bus, automated driving shuttle bus, and uh, the new kind of the vehicle uh, that can be used for uh, goods uh, delivery. Um, cities like this in China, uh, are, um, uh, uh, there are several uh, cities in China that uh, are 
uh, something like Beijing, like Shanghai, Guangzhou, Wuhan, they are also uh, uh, performing the uh, dual uh, intelligence uh, project. And the, for the construction of roadside facilities, uh, there are more than uh, 6,000 sites of roadside units have been built in various parts of China. Uh, different cities have their uh, different ways of uh, putting them uh, into practice. For example, in Changsha, uh, it has a, a smart bus line for the, uh, uh, how to say, the testing of the automated driving bus and uh, testing the uh, application of V2X. And for Wuxi, um, it has application for a whole uh, vehicle to a city uh, application architecture. And there are also some highway uh, applications, including the uh, expressway um, pillar in Shandong and a project in uh, Hunan. Uh, for mass, uh, mass production of CV2X vehicles, uh, right now in China, a number of the auto manufacturers have announced the uh, mass project, production of vehicle equipped with CV2X functions. And uh, some of the, these uh, manufacturers are in the stage of exploring co over, uh, collaborative automated driving. If you look at the left side, uh, it shows that the manufacturers have different communication modes uh, that is to be uh, equipped in their uh, vehicles, uh, like the V2X, tech, uh, uh, LT V2X, 4G, 5G, and the combination maybe 5G and the uh, LT V2X. So uh, let's go to the uh, uh, ICV standard system construction in China. Since I'm working on the standardization, so I would like to introduce a little bit about the standards uh, in China. Um, this is from my, per, uh, my perspective that the uh, uh, legal structure for ICV in China, basically it can be sliced into four, uh, four layers. The first layer is laws. They are mandatory. There are some laws regarding to the ICV as well as uh, the uh, V2X application. And the second layer from top to bottom, the second layer is regulation. They are also mandatory. These, these uh, <clears throat> regulations are more specific uh, uh, requirements. For example, the regulation on ADV public rules test, this is a policy document in China uh, with that um, the V2X uh, requirements are also proposed in this document. The next is the guidelines. Uh, most of them are voluntary. Uh, they are recommended, not mandatory. And uh, serving as the base of this structure is this uh, uh, layer of the standards. Um, it's a little compli uh, complicated actually, because some of the standards are mandatory and some standards are voluntary, but uh, <clears throat> uh, they, they play a very important role in the construction of this legal structure of the IC for the ICV industry. And to be specific for uh, the ICV technology, this is a document issued by the Chinese government um, about the ICV standard system, and, and it's, it is also a work plan, a work plan for the uh, ICV standard decision work. Um, the whole system uh, has been classified into different uh, categories in which you can find um, a specific section for connection function and application. Uh, for this whole standard system, it includes 144 uh, standard projects. And, and as I mentioned, the connected function, the V2X is one uh, of these several sections. Uh, this is the overall plan for the connected functions and application standards. Uh, we have um, in China, a roadmap for uh, connected function standards include different 
uh, several uh, categories of basic application of product and the technology extra. And there are nine standards being developed and applied for uh, connected vehicles, in which we think uh, will be serving as the base for the uh, interaction or communication between vehicles is the uh, LTE V2X technology requirements for interaction systems for the vehicle. We think is, this standard is very important because it is, uh, provide a, a channel for different uh, for uh, the vehicles on the road that can be uh, communicate with each other. Uh, based on their standards, they will have an uh, uh, opportunity to uh, develop the uh, applications, develop the scenarios. Okay, coming to the final session, the questions about standardization. Here, I would like to pro uh, propose three questions. The first is the, what's the role of standards on the development of ICV technology and industry um, to, pr uh, to promote the industry, to guide or, the, or to regulate the industry? That's the first question. And the second is how to accurately adapt to the diversified needs of the technology and the industrial development. And the, Last one is that ICV involves the vehicles, transportation, communication, smart city, and other related stakeholders. So how do they coordinate in the formulation of standards? Actually, this is also the uh, question or problems we are uh, in face of in the current uh, work in China for the standardization. Okay, uh, that's pretty much all for my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I will give back the floor to Russ. Thank you. Hank, a very nice presentation. We look forward to the discussion as we come up. Um, we're running tight on time, so I'm going to introduce our, our last speaker um, who comes from the different background, which is the infrastructure side and actually doing things in the infrastructure. And Ted Bailey uh, began his professional engineering career uh, in 1999 with the Washington State Department of Transportation. Ted is currently responsible for initiatives such as preparing for connected and automated vehicles, broadband accommodation and highway and highway into highway rights of way, automated vehicle policy, and Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act policy development and implementation, advocating for the eligibility and flexibility in transportation funding formula and grant programs. That is a huge amount of work, uh, Ted, that you've got to handle. Uh, Ted is a registered professional engineer in Washington State with a master's of science and civil engineering from the University of Washington. He has spent most of his public career advancing smart infrastructure technologies alongside a private sector venture to develop a wealth management firm. Ted, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Russ. And I, I'm grateful to be able to go last as I listen to my fellow uh, panelists here that um, definitely have a depth of knowledge in the deployment of, of V2X safety applications. And so, you know, as, a, as I think about how to couch the remarks I want to share, I really want to, to drive a couple of things home. Um, my heart is not to um, put our approach um, against the, the, the dedicated low latency discussion that you've heard so far, but rather just to simply share what I believe is the, the um, current state of affairs, especially okay. with inside the Washington State DOT. Russ, is everything okay? Yes. Okay, just wanna make sure. Um, as far as what our mindset is and how we're going about choosing what to invest in where, um, that's a big chunk of my role is to aside really from a business perspective um, when we should invest um, uh, resources at the state level into what types of, of technology. 
I definitely um, want to reiterate the keynote uh, speaker's remarks that one of the primary next steps that would, would really uh, set things in a, in a healthy direction would be USDOT providing dedicated uh, funding for low latency V to X applications. Um, that's how the interstate system was built. That's how the ITS system in the United States was built. Um, heavy federal investments and the state uh, partners um, were happy to carry out um, that mission. So from that, with that backdrop, I'm gonna go to my next slide here. And so I intentionally put a variety of terms together that go together and don't because from my perspective, the, the average um, civil engineer, electrical engineer with inside a, a state DOT sees V to X, 5G, here's 4.9, 5.9, CV to X cellular and puts them all in the same bucket. Are we investing in these things? Um, yes, um, depending on which uh, lens you decide to look at the bucket, uh, which you'll see in the, in the subsequent side, um, the investment might not be what you think. And uh, I think in many regards, unfortunately, um, when, when surveys go out and discussions and panels happen, that clarity is, is not, uh, not present. So let's take a, a high level view of the United States wireless carrier spectrum band usage. Hopefully you can see it to some degree on your screen. I know these slides will be available afterwards. And so you see 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G um, across the, what we have, uh, six carriers. And if it's green, that means that that um, spectrum is being used for something. And that is really important from the perspective of where, um, what our mindset is at as far as how we approach um, what I'm gonna call non-low latency, but really the opposite of, of Toyota's message, um, um, V to X applications, which is our focus. We really uh, look at what is the, um, the application that the, the market and the near-term need is um, focused on and what spectrum is best suited for that application. That is the, the predominant view. Um, this, uh, this slide, I, I think it's just a, it's a fun illustration um, for those like myself, again, the, the average practitioner who doesn't spend as much time as many of the people um, on this panel and, and participating in today's discussion are in, in what is communicating right now in what types um, of frequencies, right? That three kilohertz to 300 gigahertz, that radio wave spectrum. Yes, uh, most of the conversation today has been focused on that um, 5.9, that uh, the, the, whether it's the, the 30 megahertz or the 75 that we wish we had, um, but there's also a lot of other applications that a transport agency um, uses, talks about, invests in on a relatively uh, regular basis. Um, our state DOT is, is fortunate to have our own dedicated um, wireless communication radio uh, mountaintop uh, antenna system. I think we have 160 tower locations uh, statewide. I may be a little bit high on that number uh, to where we are meeting all kinds of, of different um, wireless communication needs through various spectrums, again, dependent upon the need, the topography, the interference in those uh, particular areas. So I, I'm, I'm saving the best slides for last year. So we have got about seven of these. So, so just so you know where I'm, where I'm headed. Our, of, after bringing together um, all of our wireless practitioners over the last few weeks to just really make sure that I was accurate in the way I described our near-term intent, um, I said, what, where are we using, what spectrum are we using the most for all things ID, I, ITS or what we would call non-low latency V to X applications. And by far, uh, 4.9 gigahertz is where we are currently um, spending most of our time. That's not to say that we're not interested in 5.9. We, we are interested in 5.9. In fact, uh, we, we have some examples of how we're preparing in the next couple of slides. But I just, again, want to put that perspective out there that there's a wide range of, of uh, cellular spectrum that is licensed and available for use that we believe meets a, a large degree of, of our near-term needs 
while we um, wait for that dedicated funding um, and that clarity on which 5.9 low latency applications um, are the best uh, business investment um, for a state level funding. So here's a, a kind of a bottom to top from 700 megahertz to 23 gigahertz view of what spectrum we use um, for what types of applications. I already mentioned our land mobile radio system as far as um, voice communications, 700 and 800 megahertz. Um, we used to use some unlicensed 2.4 gigahertz for a variety of, of applications in the early days um, for all the reasons that you would guess. We've moved away from, from those devices. Um, 4.9 being the predominant laundry list of uh, where we are accomplishing those, again, last mile, non-low latency type communications to complete gaps in the fiber transport system. And then when it comes to 5.9, we've really whittled it down to um, a couple of really specific things that we can that we believe we can do that have near-term value and long-term readiness. And so there's a, a, a couple of a controller manufacturers, actually more than a couple, but there's one in particular um, that you can email me about afterwards if you're curious who that is, that where we have uh, focused on buying an ATC controller because technically that controller um, is 5.9 gigahertz ready in the sense that we can add a, a, an antenna at a later date, at a later date, and we are standardizing on that equipment we have, and for all traffic signals, ramp meters, data stations, those types of applications, we are just buying a different piece of hardware that we need for near-term applications um, so it is ready. Um, beyond that, um, we are have no, unfortunately, no specific other um, V to X um, applications that we're pursuing in the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, either from a, a research or a testing um, approach, primarily because from that uh, proverbial chicken and egg scenario, um, you know, we'd love to see a, a NHTSA mandate. We'd love to see a USDOT dedicated funding stream. We need another catalyst to uh, encourage um, that investment above and beyond a, a very long list of, of, of other priorities. Um, as you go down the list, you can see um, these are, again, these are, these are not uh, necessarily uh, vehicle applications, although they indirectly could be, how we use other higher frequencies for various uh, communication um, uh, capacities. In uh, as, as a slightly more detailed uh, a look, I already commented on the first one. This, these are, again, what I would, the, the closest that um, our organization is um, capable of honestly communicating and focusing on where, what is the closest that we have in motion for V to X use cases. Um, the second one on the list, I haven't talked about that one yet. So, Right, there's there's like one company in our state. Um, again, you can email me afterwards if you're curious who that is. That has the predominant market share for all emergency vehicle preemption at a traffic signal. Um, they use lights for communication, communicating that um, signal to emergency vehicles. And if we simply procure a slightly different box. Um, then we could open up the private sector marketplace for a cellular application, non-low latency product that would get us in the direction of here is advance notice of preemption for a, a um, emergency response organization to have ahead of that line of sight communication for a traffic signal. But again, you can see the theme here. We need near-term application and we need subtle shifts in what we purchase that has both near-term and long-term value. Um, connected um, work zones, um, very much a high priority. All of the different products that are listed there um, are, are focused on cellular communications. Um, the, the pilot product, if you're not familiar with that, that's just a, a lane tapering product that um, I think it's 2.4 gigahertz between the devices and then the again the location of that incident response vehicle being communicated right through the cellular network and then 
through partnerships that Haas Alert and others have with vehicle manufacturers, that type of safety application we believe has a lot of near-term value um, and is again, a step towards um, V to X, although not a non-low latency application. Uh, truck parking, um, that's a big, a big issue um, and, and really way in motion at the same, same time for a truck bypass. Again, the technologies that we are pursuing, the prediction algorithms as far as availability of truck parking and communicating that out to the trucking industry, all of those applications for all of our conversations with the private sector um, have been focused on cellular products that are non-low latency. We definitely are open and desire to do uh, that, that more uh, the dedicated spectrum, but we haven't had sufficient private sector interest meaning the private sector would need to put those devices on their vehicles before we would put them in our way stations or in our truck parking locations. Um, as we move forward, automated speed safety camera systems um, is, is a big push. We're looking for legislative authority to be able to do that. And the ability to do, again, back to a, a potential near-term application for, for V to X, think of, of uh, speed governing through that um, um, dynamic speed changing communication. That is an, an, a near-term application that I believe could get uh, a, a, some support. Um, we'll see, we're right now we're focused on, on work zones, but um, that's an area where again, communicating the, the locations of where we have these uh, speed safety camera systems so that we can bring down speeds in work zones um, don't re doesn't require um, uh, low latency communication, but is a step towards using the wireless communication system uh, to, to provide uh, that vehicle uh, safety. Um, static and dynamic flashing beacons, that's, that's a pretty, uh, maybe it's ba barely worth mentioning, but just thinking about the ability to change um, the way that those different beacons flash in a statewide network um, through a cellular system. Again, that is it's not, it's not low latency curve speed warning applications, but it still is a cellular connection to a device like that to provide a wireless based safety application. That's where we are at. We're still focused uh, and, and uh, patiently waiting for some things to pass so that we can focus on those low latency applications, but hopefully this is helpful. And then last but not least, traveler information. I would say this is our longest standing approach to one-way communication from a state DOT to the private sector. We take a wide variety of, of pieces of information and we put them in an application program interface. You can see the list of highway alerts, cameras, toll rates, traffic flows, all those things. And again, our goal is to communicate that information to the private sector so it can be used and integrated, communicated in whatever format works for the private sector to uh, vehicles, to pedestrians. Again, wireless communication um, would be the, the second half of the pathway. Our role as a DOT is to take that information and push it out uh, one way. Um, that, that, that last comment makes me think of uh, some of the differences that perhaps um, uh, at least Washington State has from some of my, my colleagues um, overseas is that the way that our liability works, um, at least in Washington State, is a significant barrier to two-way communication. We have what's called joint and several liability with unlimited tort exposure. And so we are definitely very um, uh, intentional with when we receive information from a external source that we would use in real time for decision-making, because if anything doesn't go well in that uh, information exchange, we have unlimited tort liability as a Washington State DOT. And so our, our predominant focus that you can probably see in, in the communication thread is, is a one-way communication of information of what we're doing on the roadway system and pushing it out, hoping that over time we can navigate some of those, those two-way uh, communication liability barriers to uh, achieve some of the success that has been talked about uh, thus far um, 
in our presentation material as a panel. So with that, Russ, I'll turn it back over to you. I'm really looking forward to the 90 minutes of discussion um, so we could unpack um, some of these uh, some of these important issues. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Ted. And unfortunately, the 90 minutes is going to be closer to 60, um, given the amount of time. But these presentations have been great. But let's take a five minute break and then we will really key up um, the discussions. to start by saying that these were, for me, really great presentations. And they did a very good job of basically formulating how we're going to um, be able to move forward. So I think we have the panel here ready. Um, I'm going to start by dropping a bomb in here. I listened to the presentation, um, huge numbers of items that uh, Hang Sun listed, uh, Ted Bailey laid out a whole bunch of things, um, our car company people from the US and Europe uh, laid out their things. And member Graham did a really good job of laying out the safety issues. And then we slop it all together with V2X. Why are we doing that? These are discrete, separate things. I would like to hear from my the speakers and our colleagues. They've really thought about, are we than just going about this the wrong way. Part of the reason we don't a lot of progress is we've tried to push this blob that's called V2X in instead of looking at individual pieces, um, you should really think through. And I, I will offer whoever wants to go first on this to please um, speak up. Um, Russ, this is John. I'll, I'll take a, a first shot at this, and, and this um, I'm also thinking a bit uh, about the message from Ted uh, at the end, and, and there was also a question. Uh, why somebody asked me why why focus on direct V2X um, as opposed to other kinds of vehicular communication? And I and I and I think that's part of what your question is getting at. It, it's a, it, as, as uh, Michael and Andres both said, this is, V2X is complicated in, a, in both good ways and bad ways. Um, it's complicated to get deployed and that's been a struggle, um, but there are complex interactions that, that V2X um, brings with it such that if we could achieve this goal of widespread deployment, many, many things would come along with that. And I think that's been, the kind of holy grail that's motivated us to, to see if we could get there. And, uh, and there was a time at least when um, in the US, we had really strong momentum and felt like it was, it was definitely within grasp and we were looking at a, a, a NHTSA mandate that was going to require everyone to at least put the equipment in the car. And then there was a strong feeling that once the equipment is in the car, these benefits would flow. The automakers would have strong incentives to add all the other applications, even the ones that aren't mandated, and and uh, and then the infrastructure people would would come along, and lots of lots of things would come, and the it would be like a a, a ball rolling downhill. It would it would gain momentum, and 
if we could just get up over the top of that hill. Um, and we haven't succeeded here in doing that. And, and as a result, I think while we're still looking for ways to get there, uh, uh, automakers and, and other stakeholders are looking at alternatives, including what can we do over a, over a telecommunication network, V2N to V, for example. What can V2N to V offer us that we aren't able to get with V2V? V2N to V has one big advantage. Almost every new car has a cellular modem in it. And so is already the connectivity part is already there. But it also has a couple of significant drawbacks. It's not free. Uh, we're paying someone to use that spectrum instead of using the free spectrum. And it's uh, and, and it has potentially uh, more latency and, and unbounded latency or, or latency that we can't put strict bounds on that we might need for our safety applications. So so it's it's it hasn't been the the preferred way, but um, in light of the difficulties of, of getting widespread B2B, um, it's, a, it's an alternative that many of us are exploring. So I think what you'll see from automakers going forward is a balance between the two. Uh, we'll, we'll still be looking for ways to achieve the goals on B2B deployment. In some places that's happening uh, better than in others. And uh, at the same time, we'll be looking at all, all sorts of alternatives, including um, connectivity over a uh, a paid telecommunication network. Yeah, so member Graham, I bring this to you. Um, right now, you listed um, V2X as the priority for action that you want from NTSB. Is it really V2X or would you be pretty happy if we could get V2V mandated for um, collision avoidance and similar safety applications? You know, vehicle to anything at this point, I think is a step in the right direction. This is, none of this is going to be perfect from the start and it never will be perfect, right? There is no perfect system out there. But until we start, uh, we, we've got to start with something. The safety potential is huge out there. Um, you know, Russ, you were asking me about safety and aviation in safe systems, or as far as uh, safety culture, maybe, so to speak. But one of the ways aviation safety became uh, so, so safe was it was redundant systems. As we know, uh, collision avoidance systems, they're great. They can be, they can be better. We, we need to go farther with their development, but it's, it's early on in their, in their life. And uh, we need to continue to make that better. And aviation was the same way. There were systems out there where there was uh, traffic collision avoidance systems or ground proximity warning systems. They were not perfect at the beginning. But once they got out there, we learned a lot. They learned a lot how they, how they worked and they were able to tweak and make, and make them better. And I think uh, the potential with vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrians or whatever it may be. Um, we need to start somewhere and we need to start now so we can start learning those lessons to make the systems better. So uh, what that exactly looks like, I don't know, but until we start deploying, I don't think we're really gonna know the full potential of it. I fully agree that we won't know the full potential. And I very much, have uh, over the last few years come to the conclusion that we need to get something out. And if you look at the US case, NHTSA can regulate B2B. NHTSA can't do the other side of B to anything else. They have the same thing we talked about in the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations. WP29 can do vehicle to vehicle. WP29 cannot do vehicle to other things. Uh, very complicated. Seems to me one of our possibilities is to say, let's go ahead and look at just the simple start of safety applications with B2V. Um, we'll try to see if we can get 
regulation together, it's uh, as well as WP29, with some very simple caveats. The, the most important one is that all these new cars are starting to have uh, software updates over the air so that we can put in regulation that we have to have um, V2V, it already will have to handle the existing regulations for cybersecurity. And we should say that the, the, v to, the V2V devices certainly need to be updated, able to be updated over the air for things in the future. So Hang Sen, let me move to the China side because you did a great job in covering these things. Has China thought about separating um, V2V from different kinds of V2X um, capabilities and using potentially different applications, different spectrums, uh, different standard structures? Uh, thank you, Russ. Thank you for uh, bringing this question to me. Um, actually, uh, in China, as I mentioned in my uh, PPT presentation, um, there are several um, pillar uh, zones in China. Actually, in these pillar zones, uh, they are uh, uh, conducting both the V2X applications and uh, the V2V applications. But uh, um, they are more are focusing on the V2X. For example, the vehicle for infrastructure, especially in the uh, intersections, when the uh, vehicle is approaching the uh, intersection, the uh, uh, traffic lights can send the uh, message to the vehicle for uh, avoiding the collision, for providing more information about the traffic uh, uh, accident, uh, for promoting the uh, um, transportation efficiency. And this is what they have been doing in the this uh, traffic in these uh, pillar zones, um, but also the uh, uh, V2V uh, uh, technology is also uh, um, uh, promoting by the uh, local government and also the central government of China. Uh, from the uh, standardization point of view, um, now we are uh, firstly um, focusing on the V2V standard. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, it does not rely on the infrastructure. We all know the infrastructure requires a lot of the investment. So maybe the first step is to uh, uh, encourage the uh, uh, manufacturers to equip the uh, equipment for the V2V communication. And uh, uh, we can have a standard for that to realize the uh, communication between different brands. And after that, actually, uh, if we use the technology of um, IoT V2X, it, it can not only use the for V2V communication, but I can also use the for the V2, uh, V2 infrastructure communication. But um, uh, after the V2V, we can uh, uh, develop a standard for the uh, V2X. That's the idea in my mind. But um, in general, in China, actually, the two kinds of the technology are uh, some, somehow uh, uh, proceeding uh, parallelly uh, uh, right now. That's my response to this question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shannon. And, and, and I look at um, our work as we go forward with the V2X task force, and I think there's uh, a good argument to say, do the V2V first and move forward. But I'm going to stick Andreas. Andres, um, you heard Ted Bailey go through the different kinds of communications they're using. Um, when 5.9 was started, which is 25 years ago, people only had analog phones. And being able to communicate two or 300 meters on 5.9 was stretching it. Now, we got millimeter wave, we can go up to whatever, 60, 70 uh, gigahertz. Um, we've got radar at 78 to 81. Why is the 
community that's trying to do this D2X so stuck on a Mickey Mouse little 5.9 allocation that doesn't have enough capacity to do the applications you want, is under pressure for interference. Why don't you going and spending your time going and looking at what is there at 30, 30 gigahertz, 50 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, what have you, to go find substantial spectrum that can really do the job. Yeah, um, I think so. Globally, spectrum is is you know different and and but but it's always and everywhere limited. Um, and I think what we are actually looking for is just a step one. And you need to invest into a technology and the frequency and the solution in order for that to productize. And the reason why we are we are sticking to the existing foundations is because we think that 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 should be the next step to a different frequency band, millimeter wave or whatever, this, this can be a good alternative. But since we have been already like 15 years ago, 20 years spent into trying to productize, uh, try to bring it on the road, uh, we would need to redo a lot of those test specifications um, and a lot of things that went after you know, we just figured out how to how to create how to transmit like one byte on that given frequency. So the whole industry needs to rebuild itself on another technology. The automotive requirements needs to come in, and there are a lot of uh, things that need to happen after, uh, for example, chips appear and these kind of things. And that 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 timeline is a little bit, I think, would be set back if we would need to reshovel some of the properties. And that kind of, so I, we are really saying that that I think V2X communication will, in or, or vehicular communication need, will and need to include V2N and N2V, as John was also saying, but it's very important that we can, can save lives today with the existing infrastructure and the existing assets that we have and i think we should do it right now i mean it's it's we we, we know the technology we have the technology it's, it's working we just need to go on and, and deploy as soon as possible and then extend this great technology because i think it really will save a lot of lives in the future and be much more complex and I, I mean you saw the the roadmaps and the future applications that we need we will need uh, to progress further and we want to build this ecosystem of the connected car um, but we, we need to start somewhere. And I think that somewhere is 5.9 for V to V at least. Um, hey, Russ, can I, can I sure. chime in on the, on the millimeter? Go ahead. Yeah, this is John. Uh, so we at Toyota have done a lot of research in millimeter wave for V to X in the 60 gigahertz band. Um, and it is still a research, uh, topic. Um, it's not ready for deployment, but, um, we, our view is that that is a nice complement to the 5.9, but not a replacement for. And the main reason is that in 5.9 gigahertz, you can broadcast and all of the vehicles within a, within a two or three or, or 500 meter range around you will hear it. Um, with millimeter wave, you, in order to get any kind of reasonable range, you have to send a narrow beam to just one other device. And so the use cases that it supports are perhaps interesting, but also different. A lot of that awareness communication that we're doing with basic safety messages or um, spat and map messages or, or, or any, any of the ones that we talk about the most often, um, we, we really need a broadcast uh, band. And, and so 5.9 is what we have. Um, we'd like to expand it, but, um, but as Andres was just saying, in order to, to get this ad hoc communication going, we need to all agree on what we're striving for. And, and it's best not to introduce uh, some some significant new element to that uh, uncertainty at this point. So 5.9, I think, for better or worse, is where, where we need to deploy. It will be interesting to see how this deploys. Because yes, we've talked to this uh, and worked on it for a long time. But I get the feeling, and this is a feeling, and, and I listen to these things that are going, 
that we've spent 25 years and we've got nothing. We were on 1G when we started at 5.9. Um, and there's all kinds of things of, well, this didn't work. These people weren't cooperative. This didn't happen. Maybe we should at least go back and think about it. Not gonna decide it here, we're not gonna get anywhere. But go back and think about maybe there are multiple applications. There are multiple approaches. John, you made the point, and I think it's correct, that um, different spectrum can do different things. Um, we have to, to look at it. But I want to give Ted a chance to really get in. And he's, he's the guy uh, on the other side of these things. Thanks, Russ. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat and looking at the different themes. and. I feel like a, an important part of the conversation we need to spend a more time on is, is who should own, operate, maintain, and preserve these systems, right? I'm a, after 24 years in state government, I'm a firm believer that, that what we do really well is provide access to right away. We know how to lease, we know how to partner from that perspective. When we start thinking about shared ownership of safety critical equipment, it it hits a wide variety of, of barriers, some of the ones that I've, I've talked about already. And so from that perspective, I think if we can, that's what I like about the V2V focus is it doesn't require uh, a state infrastructure owner operator like the state DOT to do anything. Um, we can still maintain and operate our uh, roadway infrastructure like we have been and we can become aware and we can help promote and communicate and educate the public on what their car does, and we can do all the great things we do with our fellow state agencies, but we don't have to get in the middle of the safety critical application. And then so because that is so um, tied to who do you need inside organizations to champion the implementation of these topics? It's not senior level management, it's, it's middle level management, and it's the maintenance people. And so when you already have a, a technology infrastructure that has been invested in for 20 years, the ITS infrastructure that was built, again, 90-10 Fed state match, that is um, woefully unfunded for long-term preservations, hundreds of millions of dollars underwater for our state alone, it's arguably impossible to convince those people that have those roles to advocate for yet another piece of equipment that technically near term is optional. And so that's where I'd like to have some more discussion on, is there a way forward that doesn't require um, the, the, the public agencies to do more than lease access to uh, right away? Yes, and see, I think that that is part of the, overall issue. Um, if I take the pieces and decompose them again, the V2V part, which definitely needs a low latency and accuracy and what have you, does not require any infrastructure from you. It doesn't require anything to be done besides get the device in the car. Um, and yes, um, We'll see what that device is. And I, I honestly, I personally <clears throat> have questions on why we, to, that we really need to look at. Um, is there better technology and take four, four or five years on these things to put together regulations and actually get, get things out in the car anyway? But Let's see, but I want to go back to member Graham. Um, you made a point that the safety culture and the safety experience in the airline world was done piece by piece. Um, things got out, um, we, they were learning, they captured some of the benefits, then we, you learn more, they captured more of the benefits. Is that kind of approach practical, appropriate, et cetera, for the automotive world to, to 
try to get um, the benefits of things? Do we try to hit a single? Um, are we should are should we keep going for a home run? Well, that's that's a tough question. Um, I look at uh, a lot of the major airlines out there. Actually, I think every major airline out there in, in the in the world has a flight data monitoring program. They have flight data recorders. They monitor their data. And matter of fact, some of these are monitoring their data all the time. Their their engines uh, are being monitored all the time and being sent by, uh, I believe, Jeep satellites and everything else. Um, you know, that's there's there's memorandums of understanding that have been put together that protect data, but uh, the sharing of data is is what's going to make the system uh, more safe, make a safer system. And how we do that with vehicles that <laughs> I leave that to a lot of you because uh, I already know there's uh, you know uh, manufacturers that that want to protect their data, right? And, uh, and, and then they should want to. Uh, how that's gonna look in the future, I don't know, but if we can get to some point of sharing data and learning from the data as, a, as an industry, it, it'll, it'll make the systems better and uh, it'll, we'll get there to a much more robust safety system quicker that way. But how that looks with the numbers of, of vehicles we're talking about, uh, I don't know how that's going to look. Well, that's that's the challenge that um, our car company guys, Andres and John, have to look at. Um, it is it is a absolutely serious problem, uh, we, and we we have the continued issue that cars are on the road. Um, for a very long time in many countries. And we have to think about how we can update them going forward, how we can have so many different things happening, how we can get new things in. Um, I'll go back to Andres and let you speak on that. Yeah, thanks, Russ. I also wanted to reply to, to what Ted raised. Uh, and I also wanted to 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 increase a little bit the 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 opportunistic or the the, the positive vibe, uh, because I see see it not that negative. Of course, I'm sitting in Europe, but still globally, I think uh, we have gone far and we have a lot of achievements. And of course, we can improve, but 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 uh, but I think we are not uh, uh, completely at the beginning. And when it comes to V2V, I think Ted, you you said it really really well that 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 um, in, decreases the scope and responsibility of, of for example the rule maker and 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 yes that's that's a really good start. And what I see what I can see for example in Europe is that the road operators and the cities and the highways and and the and the countries are actually jumping on the opportunity freely because they see that they have problems they want to solve. And some of those problems can be solved by I2V and they are freely from their own will investing and deploying and they will need to maintain that for 20, 25 years um, because they see that it works. And for example, you know, collecting, collecting data, identifying uh, crashes very, very fast uh, and a lot of other things that, that these, this enables, I see a much more positive and they are actually queuing up to introduce new, newer and newer I2V services that they want to get on the road because they see that this works. And again, no, no rush, no push from, from any, anyone. They are, they are investing because they see that it works. And it's actually, I mean, compare a V2X unit to a, a signalized uh, a LED panel. I mean, you can deploy uh, many, many, many kilometers of, of coverage uh, or, or many stations with like in exchange for one's, one's price. And you can uh, uh, send tremendously more amount of data for many more services with one unit where you have, you know, on this, these left panels, you have like two lines of, of text and you can either tell them to de in, decrease the speed or watch out for something, but not everything. And with V2X, you can just, you know, 
queue up a lot of different uh, uh, messages in a lot of different places and times, and all of them will work. So it's 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 very a good. The return on investment is really good here. Great, um, Hang Sun, you've been listening to this very care quietly and carefully. What do you think um, now as you're hearing this discussion? Thank you, Russ. Um, it, uh, actually, I would like to revise on something uh, on a little bit about the data sharing. Uh, I, I think this is a very ch uh, challenge uh, topics. Um, you know, um, right now for the V2X technology, uh, we have to be more careful about the data sharing than before, because we all know that uh, when we are uh, using the uh, um, LTV 2X, especially for the direct uh, uh, communication, uh, actually it will um, use a broadcast, something called the broadcast mode. Actually the vehicle can uh, send out the message to all the vehicles sur uh, surrounding uh, the Eagle vehicle and every vehicle can uh, receive the message. But uh, if you have the uh, certificate that you can get the, uh, the, the, the content of the uh, message, but uh, if you don't have that certificate that you cannot decipher the message. So um, the cybersecurity for the, uh, this uh, technology will be crucial. Um, that's why um, the data sharing is more careful. Let me take, um, and uh, for the uh, point of view from the uh, standardization, uh, actually, uh, recently we have a standards call, calling, uh, it, it is called the driver monitoring uh, system standard. Uh, this standard is for the, uh, uh, to, to promote, promote the safety of the driving of, uh, by, uh, by the method of monitoring the state, status of the uh, driver. For example, if he is um, or, or she is uh, sleeping, she is, uh, he or she is uh, smoking, the system can issue a message to, uh, to, to warn the uh, driver. Uh, actually, um, in the past, we do not uh, care about the data uh, protection for this scenario, but right now in our standard, it's even uh, said that uh, the, uh, the, the information uh, gathered for this scenario can only be used for the uh, driver monitoring, but uh, it cannot be sent out to, uh, outside the vehicle to the external instructors or other vehicles. So that's uh, just an example for how um, the data sharing is um, important uh, in the V2X technology. Yeah, thank you. I agree that the data and the data sharing is very important and i'll turn to um let's start with andres how do you think you're going to be able to make um data sharing um happen um among car companies yeah i um that, that's a hard that's a hard question that's a, that's definitely a hard question because i think what you're pointing at is is the mutual trust uh because uh and and what is actually the reality right now is that that uh we have we 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 don't see how an adas engineer or uh, would uh, use in a functional safety context context information coming from a from a from a third party car which he or she has no information about it. So that's the starting problem. And that's why currently we are only able to do information displays to drivers uh, based on B2V as of, as of today. And, and uh, I think what, what the, 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 the main points are is reliability and knowing how other systems were built, so commonly accepted building blocks and tests for these building blocks. So the second uh, second thing we need to do is have commonly agreed tests so that everyone uh, is able to, to agree on, okay, how is that third party product that I'm receiving information from tested? And if we go along that way, 
The third thing is commonly agreed processes and rules. I think uh, that we will need to have some sort of common uh, a framework of, of compliance assessment and type approval for, for long term, we, which all of the OEMs who are using B2B would commonly agree upon. And that, that would mean that if, if the third party vehicle sending me data will no longer be treated as a black box, but as a box implementing something that I'm very familiar of, and I actually know how the third party have been testing that, that equipment so that I can trust what, what, uh, how they have been doing and what kind of information with what kind of assurance. Of course, this is again, a long way of forward, but I think this is, this is the direction we need to take. And this is John, I'm gonna jump in here. I'm not sure if we lost Russ, but um, maybe he's there or maybe he'll come back. But uh, let me, I just wanna piggyback on what you're saying, Andres. With regard to the, the exchange of data B2X, um, maybe most of the audience knows this, but let me just review kind of the background. So one fundamental aspect of trusting what you receive is that every message will come with a digital signature uh, that can be resolved and, and verified to prove that the that the entity that generated the message with, was authorized to do that. Now that doesn't mean the content is is exactly right. It just means it was sent from an authorized sender, and we've come up with a clever way to do that while preserving the privacy of who that sender was. So we have privacy, but but trusted communication. Um, and, and when we're talking about exchange of something like a BSM or a CAM, that's usually enough for us to, uh, to trust that the data content is, is, uh, is valid because the vehicle is speaking on behalf of itself. And we have standards in Etsy and in SAE and, and in China to um, provide minimum accuracy requirements. For example, when I tell you I'm traveling at a certain speed, I have to I have to live within that accuracy requirement, location, whatever. What gets harder is when we move into the um, collective perception world, where we're sharing not only our own vehicle state but our sensors state, what we're what we're seeing. Uh, that's that's a level of indirection that opens up a lot of uh, a lot of degrees of freedom, and and that's that's very powerful. But it also makes trust harder. Um, and it also makes, just from a technical point of view, it makes using the data harder because um, you know, speed is speed, but an image is not necessarily an image. Um, an image from one camera might not be the same as an image from another camera. So there's a lot of research going on right now in how to fuse data, sensor data that comes from a variety of sources, uh, from a variety of, of, of perspectives, for example, on a, on a given intersection. And that's a complicated, Using uh, technology uh, process, uh, but it, it's it's made more complex if we're, uh, for example, combining images that come from different cameras, and so that's that's an extra challenge that comes with data sharing uh, of, of, of uh, sensor data type as opposed to vehicle type, vehicle type. Um, but I, I I think that these things can be overcome, and, and as Andres said, there's some certain steps that we can we can take um, to all have as much commonality and much common understanding as possible so that we can use the data that, that are actually available for us. It looks like Russ is back. Yeah, sorry about that. Member Graham, how valuable do you think data sharing is on the, the list of things related to vehicle communications? Well, I, I think our, our other panelists are a lot smarter on this subject than I am uh, and obviously understand the uh, complications and the technicality of, of sharing the data and what what's important, what needs to be protected and what doesn't. Um, and, and is it a reliable source? Uh, what John was talking about is very interesting. Um, but I think, you know, initially it you know, those simple messages need to be reliable and, and need to be trusted, like John was saying. Uh, down the road for advanced uh, uh, applications of this, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not the engineer here, but uh, I think it's going to be very important uh, for sharing data and, and learning 
uh, how the systems are working and how to make them better, there's going to have to be some kind of data sharing. What that looks like, I don't know at this point. Um, hey, Russ, can I jump in here on sure. this on the data sharing? So yes. I have a practical example. Um, as we explore the wide world of third party data sources, and this is one of these, these conversations, um, what we quickly get into is more data isn't um, better, at least not for, for our state DOT. And this is why. If we all of a sudden have an influx of data that shows us where we have traction control um, flags going off or windshield wiper data statewide, which would be wonderful from one perspective, unless we have a response plan for how we are going to deal with that data in an equitable resourced way, we're actually worse off because we've now exposed ourselves to unlimited tort. And so as we look at ways of bringing in data, we need to, at least for Washington State DOT, the ability to compartmentalize what data stream and largely even what application and what roadway segment so that we, we can slowly scale our ability to respond to the new information. Now that may be a uniquely United States or Washington State problem, but at least for us, um, that is that is a very consistent lens for which we see that data transition, coupled with public-private um, uh, transparency and government laws, which basically for us, if you've shared it with government, you might as well put it on Facebook and the internet because we, we can't protect anything and you can't um, mark confidential as a way of protecting it. And so our typical... That's why our typical mode of operation has been find a way to make the roadway safer without having to do that information exchange with us because of those, those issues. So we're really trying to figure out how to do it, but compartmentalization of the data is really important. Member Grant, how does say to Washington, Ted, others get liability protection, particularly on these safety things where we may be in a position that we have technologies that will um, save nine out of 10 people, but yet the one person that isn't saved may think that they, their family, um, their lawyers, what have you, can sue for a large amount of money um, because it didn't get 100%? Uh, that's a good question. I'll remind you I'm not the regulator <laughs> and I'm not the legislator. Uh, but no, you, you bring up a very good point. Um, it, you know, it's going to happen sooner or later, unfortunately. But, um, you know, it's really up. I think that kind of stuff is really up to the regulator and 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 the legislative bodies to to protect that kind of stuff. Um, when I talked about data sharing in aviation, a lot of that's protected by an agreement between the operator and the Federal Aviation Administration, and that data is protected by law. Um, and then it's shared between the two, but then if there's any sharing amongst the community, it's completely de-identified. Um, so how that would look in this situation, I, I really don't know, but there, unfortunately, there are some legal work that's gonna have to be done with, with, with this. Um, I, I just don't know what that angle looks like at this time. Okay. I'll, I'll answer that, Russ. Sure. It just, it just, it just needs a catalyst. Right. I mean, we're still in a politically driven system. Right. And so if bringing if the barrier to this topic, uh, if, if a, a hundred million dollars of federal funding is sitting right there, if we find a way to incorporate uh, two way data exchange, we will find a way because there's the catalyst necessary for that exchange and the the legislative um, negotiation and process that would need to ensue. That is. Uh, a, a unfortunate reality of, of, of politics, right? And so it just needs to be a catalyst. And I wish it, I could say that that projecting the number of lives saved would be a, a sufficient catalyst. Um, it's too indirect. It needs to be a direct 
your state, it's like, here's, here's an example. Um, we produced our um, statewide electrical vehicle infrastructure plan in six weeks. Why? Because there was, I think, $75 million that was unleashed by the US DOT the moment that that plan was created. That catalyst can help open doors that typically politically or culturally are closed. Okay. It'll be an interesting challenge. I want to go back to something I heard from you guys a little while ago. I heard standards. Um, I heard Etsy from Europe, uh, SAE from the US. Um, I heard China. What's the coordination of these standards and how, how do they become consistent? And why isn't there an ISO effort doing the standards activity? Russ, can I maybe start? Or John, do you sure. want to go ahead? No, go ahead, Andres. Yeah, all right. So, um, I mean, Russ, all, all the regions have their own um, different properties. Um, uh, think about the, 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 the BSM uh, propagation rules or geo-networking. Think about China doing, doing positioning in a, in a different way. So we need to be flexible. We cannot create one, one single... Um, 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 specification for all regions, but uh, companies like like Consignia, for example, we are we are you know we are working on uh, harmonizing uh, because we are also in in parallel creating products and in parallel creating standards and helping the standardization. And of course, and by the way, not just us but the OEMs as well. All of us intend to create a more simple, more more centralized, more more. So more common uh, solution for for all the all the global for, for the for the different regions. So actually, I would first propose that that it's the standardization uh, companies or the companies doing standardization who are responsible for harmonizing this because it's our it's our benefit, it's our goal uh, to to simplify the life for us and have not three completely different solutions for the same problem but something similar while also maintaining and respecting the different properties of the regions. Sorry, John, go ahead. I, I agree with everything you said, Andres, and, and I'll add a couple of points. One, as a, as a global automobile company, there are advantages to us if we can have a single global standard for something. But my observation is that in the V2X space, there hasn't, that hasn't been a compelling enough reason to to, um, to cause us to converge on a single global standard. Instead, there have been forces that have, uh, uh, maybe not even intentionally, just, just, just through the accident of, of simultaneous development, there have been forces that have led to different uh, solutions in different regions. And, and those different solutions are, are um, effective. So take the CAM, plus denim message in Europe compared to the VSM in, in the US. They have strengths, each one has its strengths and weaknesses, but I think objectively we can say both get the job done. And, um, and so they started in parallel and it's not surprising that those experts in those regions came up with slightly different solutions, but they're not very different. And, and in fact, we have a strong harmonization, standardization harmonization effort led by US DOT and by the European Commission about 10 years ago to, to uh, maximize the degree of harmonization that we could achieve. And we actually did quite well on that. And, and, uh, and that, that continues today where we continue to harmonize, especially between Etsy and SAE on, uh, for example, security and IEEE with, with security. So, so we're, we're working to harmonize as much as we can, but I think it's okay if there are some regional differences. Uh, we don't want to we don't want to do anything that creates an extra barrier to moving forward with deployment. We have enough of those barriers already. And if we imposed uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, a global standard requirement, that would be still another barrier that we, we really don't need. Um, so I expect there'll still be some heterogeneity in these systems uh, for a long time to come. And, and at the same time, we'll learn from each other and the best elements of one solution will work its way into another region uh, if it's clearly superior. Yeah, Hang Sun, what is China doing in looking at harmonization of its relevant standards to 
um, Europe, U.S., et cetera? Um, yes, um, actually, it's another challengeable uh, question of problem for how to uh, co coordinate the standards um, internationally or even just uh, domestically. So, um, from my uh, perspective, uh, just as I mentioned in my presentation, um, it has to be decided by uh, the diff uh, each country itself because uh, every country, every um, nation, they have their own uh, legal um, uh, uh, front, uh, structure. Um, they are different. In China, as I mentioned, uh, we have a four-layer uh, legal uh, structure from uh, uh, their laws, regulations, uh, recommendations, and also the standards. So um, all the standards, if they want to be coordinated or harmonized, they have to based on their um, uh, respective uh, structure of the laws and regulations in their own countries. Um, and uh, in the inter uh, from the international uh, point of view, actually we already have the uh, international uh, organization for standard standardization uh, for example tc22 and tc204 they can do a lot of the work for uh, uh harmonization of the standards of v2x and also we have uh, w29 we have uh, itu to do some uh work on the regulations they will be um, um promoting the harmonize of the standards and um, uh, right now in China, actually, um, we we think um, for V2X, uh, it also has the um, different phases uh, for um, uh, for its whole development, just like the uh, uh, taxonomy of the automated uh, uh, for driving automation. It has uh, six uh, phases or six uh, six levels. Uh, level uh, zero to level six. For V2X, we can also uh, work out uh, a plan for different phases. For uh, from my per uh, perspective, uh, the pre preliminary phases, we can only uh, uh, we can just define the uh, outcome, or we can just create uh, create um, uh, criteria for uh, the outcome and uh, uh, the, um, but for the V2X technology, unfortunately, if we have uh, a lot of the possibilities on the, if we have a lot of the uh, uh, solutions, uh, that is a problem. So uh, we can just define the outcomes and let the market decide uh, which solution is the best. And uh, when we develop, uh, when the uh, industry uh, developed into a more mature phase that we can set standards for uh, one or just a uh, uh, few uh, solutions to choose. Uh, that's the idea uh, come up uh, from my mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let me switch to a, another thing. Um, NCAP. There's NCAP um, in um, most um, areas. New car assessment program. What it stands for, it's how, how you get um, what we would call star rating to things. Is there a, a possibility of V2X being put into NCAP in any of the regions? Maybe I can take that first. Uh, as Euro and Cap and Europe is 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 dealing with with V two X. Uh, I guess uh, Hang, you also would 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 talk about how China and Cap is 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 uh, is uh, working because China and Cap is also very active. Uh, and and I would also suggest. Um, or I, 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 I would try to bring a good uh, example for, for the US and CAP because uh, in US and CAP, we, we still see that, that, uh, that uh, the uptake of V2X could be, could be better because 
we we can show and have shown the safety benefits of V2X and and the end caps can actually visualize um, the safety benefits. So it can be a channel, a medium for um, the OEMs or this this industry to show to the consumers that here are the safety benefits of V2X. Because to be honest. Uh, it's really hard to sell safety. It's much easier to sell the convenience service. Uh, and it's really hard to show them and to, 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 to put a value or a score or whatever on V2X and on the safety benefits of V2X. And, and NCAP does just that. It gives you a number. It gives you a star um, for, for if, if it can really do a job of advancing the level of safety, protect you more. And that's that's what, what NCAP and your NCAP was looking for, new ways uh, of improving safety for Europe. And there has been done a lot of tests and, and your NCAP has awarded uh, and, and highlighted a lot of V2X uh, safety use cases, mainly, of course, dealing with the main problem that that uh, Mr. Graham was showing in the first presentation, the dust storm problem, the non-line of sight problem, uh, the detection problems, those are all something that V2X can, can solve. And that's what EuroNCAP has recognized. And that's why V2X is on, on the EuroNCAP roadmap. And once that's there, there will actually be a good trigger for the market to introduce this because of course, consumers will want uh, higher scores and those higher score would mean better protection in more, more use cases. And those use cases could be uh, non-line of size use cases. Hans, Hanks, and do you, are you able to talk about what NCAP in China has been looking at in the way of V2X? Uh, yes, yes, I can talk about a little about it, uh, even though I'm not responsible for the NCAP, but um, uh, we, we have a department in Starks, they are um, responsible for that. But I heard that, uh, um, the current version of the uh, same cap uh, does not include the V2X, but uh, right now they are working on the next um, version of the uh, same cap. It will be issued in 2024. Uh, in that uh, version, actually uh, in the discussion uh, uh, of the next uh, version, um, the Chinese industry talked a lot about the uh, uh, V2X functions uh, that uh, uh, maybe can be uh, put into the next version. But uh, I think the final decision has not been uh, made uh, by so far. Um, uh, they are working on that. Uh, actually, um, um, I think the uh, V2X is uh, really uh, crucial. And uh, uh, in the long run, I think it will be definitely put into the Protocol of the China new uh, new uh, system of progress. It's just like uh, in the past, we have a lot of the new uh, applications. For example, the, the CRS, the Children Restraint System. Um, firstly, it it is started uh, uh, in the uh, in cap. Uh, the market uh, it, it has a good uh, reflection from the market. They think uh, to put the CRS in the uh, NCAP is really uh, important for the safety of the uh, uh, passengers. So uh, after that, when the uh, NCAP use uh, this, uh, put, put, uh, you uh, have this new uh, protocol, uh, and um, the uh, the current version uh, in uh, incorporate that kind of the. Uh, evaluation. So I think in the long run, the uh, B tracks will definitely be, be put into the uh, same cap. Yeah, thank you. That would be great. Uh, and China leading the way again would be um, very nice. Member Graham, can NTSB have any influence on the US NCAP activity towards getting um, at least one V2X application into a future version of US NCAP? Oh, I wish I wish we could. We, we have tried for a long time, as probably many of you have, and I really uh, give credit to the other nations for, uh, you know, 
basically through their end caps incentivizing not you know collision avoidance systems and hopefully potentially uh, b2x um, we've been calling for it for a long time we we can't even get collision avoidance systems on the current us end cap um, that's very disappointing so uh, i think the the consumer really gets uh sold short on that and, and if we could get a little bit of regulatory certainty and get something on the NCAP or maybe possibly the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, their vehicle safety rating program, I think that would definitely incentivize the industry to move forward on this. But uh, right now, I, I don't know what it's going to take to get NCAP to just get start with CAS. <laughs> I, I don't know what to get it, how to get them moving. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I see our time is most up. I want to give each of you one last word. So I'll go in reverse order of speakers. So Ted, I'll let you put in your final word to start. Well, I'll start my final word by thanking my fellow panelists for having a, a great discussion here. Um, I'm going to leave it with this. Uh, dedicated funding from the US DOT, hold harmless funding, not eligibility, everything's eligible for V to X safety applications. Put the funding there and the state DOTs will deploy, we'll figure it out. Um, that fundamental catalyst um, alongside uh, some V to V regulation from NHTSA, those couple of things um, would be fantastic. And so um, looking forward to seeing how this thing takes shape in the future. Thank you. Hang Sen. You have a last word. Uh, firstly, thank you all for organizing such a wonderful uh, meeting. And it's my uh, uh, great honor to join this discussion. Um, actually, the uh, V2X um, is still in the progress of development. And China is also willing to learn the experiences from the other countries and uh, international organizations. And we are also willing to uh, share our uh, experience to all the uh, experts uh, in the auto industry. And I am I, looking forward to cooperate with all the uh, countries and the experts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, John? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank Russ and UNEC for this invitation. This is a great opportunity and, and thank my fellow panelists um, I maybe want to leverage uh, one of the final words that Mark just said, uh, which is cooperate. Um, as Martin Bame from C Roads likes to say, we're talking about cooperative ITS, and so we need to cooperate. Uh, and that might seem simple, but it turns out that that uh, that's one of those things where where it's maybe more difficult than to achieve than than it appears on the surface it should be. So we we have we have the technology for V2X in place. I think it's not a technology limited problem. Um, the problems are coming more on the deployment side. We have we have good we have good head starts on deployment examples in Europe and, and Japan. We have an interesting potential shown in the in China. Uh, the US is is more of a mess, frankly, uh, but I still have optimism that we'll find a way through that. But it's not going to happen. I think it's not going to happen without some some concerted efforts uh, to bring industry players together, key stakeholders together, and probably there needs to be a role for government uh, regulators to help facilitate that, if not to revisit the possibility of, of deployment mandates, which I think should be on the table. Uh, so deployment, 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 that's the key word, and, and that's, the, that's the big challenge we have in front of us. Thank you. Thank you. Andres? Yeah, trying to piggyback in on John in the other way this time. So it was it was a pleasure uh, with, to work with with you all. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you for for IT and UNIC for in, in inviting us. Uh, I would just reiterate what John was saying. V2X is there, can save lives. Um, it it works. Uh, please be patient. You need to start somewhere, and that somewhere is is starting of deployment, and it will only save you know, 1% of the, of the potential lives lost uh, in the first three years, but we need to start uh, uh, building this system. And, and the longer we wait or any of the regions longer wait, the, the later this, this, this benefit materializes. 
so so uh, I would just say that 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 uh, that ready. Let's let's go and let's do it and and let's build on there with with newer and newer generation of of, of safety systems because fatalities happen today and we could overcome them tomorrow. But for that, we need deployment. Thank you, Russ. Great, Member Graham. Thank you, Russ. I want to thank everybody for allowing me to be part of this uh, discussion and, and do the presentation to start things off. I want to thank my other panelists. Uh, I have learned a lot from you today. Um, you know, when I started uh, working with this issue, when I came to the board, um, at least in the U.S., this uh, this issue, V2X, seemed like it was pretty much dead. I don't even think it was on life support. Um, so I am very encouraged uh, with the results of about the last six months of where this is going. Um, the discussions are happening on all levels, including government now, which I don't think they had been for the last six years. So I'm uh, encouraged to see, I'm hoping the DOT is going to take a leadership role and, and come out with a uh, nationwide plan and lead the way. Um, so uh, I just want to remind everybody, let's not let perfect be the enemy of good. And like, like John and Andrew said, let's, let's start with something. Let's get something to deployed. It will not be perfect to begin with, but let's learn from it and make it better from there because we are losing lives today that we have the potential of saving. So sooner is better than later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have to really thank all of the uh panelists and presenters um i know some of you had to get up early uh some of you are staying up very late uh, that's part of the worldwide structure we live in so i appreciate it um, thank you guys for made great contributions uh, and we will look towards how we carry forward i also want to really thank the staff both from unece and itu on putting this together making it run smoothly uh, and um, look forward for all of you uh, for next year. And with this, I'll turn it over to Francois for the final wrap up. Thank you so much, Russ, for this fantastic panel. It's been great, great discussions this afternoon. Let me thank also our panelists today, Hung, Andras, John, Ted, as well as our keynote speaker, board member Graham, Ladies and gentlemen, the symposium is coming to a close. But before we close, uh, let, let me just say a few thank you. I want to say thank you to those who helped us to make this uh, four-day symposium a success. I'd like to, to thank on behalf of ITU and UNECE, the moderators of the four days, uh, Raz, Roger, Michael, Ian. They created an excellent program and they are at our side for so many years. Thank you then to all the panelists and keynote speakers. Uh, thank you also to our dignitaries, the leaders of our organizations, and also Jean Todd, who is a blessing to UNSCE and the United Nations family. You know, he's doing so much for road safety. I'm very grateful to our managers for the resources, Walter and Bilal, they helped us a lot. I want to say thank you to the colleagues of uh, ITU that are doing so much for this symposium, of course, Stefano, Gifty, and the others. And I want to thank the audience, of course, we were so pleased to see that many of you are registering year after year. I hope that the symposium next year will find its natural home at the Geneva International Motor Show next year. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you for joining. Stay safe. See you soon at the symposium in 2024. Goodbye.